now it's time for the last session for this uh, uh, excellent day of uh, debate and talks. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome all, all my co-moderators. And um, I would like to invite the first speaker in the session, um, Dr. Hanan Gawish, to talk to us about the treat the whole, not the whole. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Ahmad Taha, for this uh, invitation. I used to be with him since the very early one. He reminded us of uh, his meeting today. And uh, I don't know why, when he asked me to have a case, I, I thought of this patient. This patient was uh, presented to us year 2005, and that was a year after we received our uh, medical training by Andrew Bolton in Manchester Foot Clinic, and we were back to our surgeon to form with them the first interdisciplinary team to work together in a diabetes setting, not in the uh, surgery department. Our patient was an employee with us in the main Mansoura University Hospital, and he has very simple case, as you see, of an ulcer in, uh, on the metatarsal head. Uh, the decision was because of uh, recurrence and prolonged ulceration, they were afraid of uh, infection, and they planned to do a metatarsal head resection, and we heard about it today. And this operation, by that time, we as a team, we were having a bad impression with this type of operation. We cannot say we did have experience about it, but I can confess that we do have very bad impression with this type of operation because one of our patients was having this by that time, year 2005 also, we were seeing three or four cases like this, with well done operation that was able to offload the ulcer and heal. And as Professor Martinez showed us today, we did have ulceration. And even after we do offload our patient and we succeeded to heal her ulcer, we usually have a bomb like that's usually a re ulceration and a re ulceration occur, whether on the first or on the fifth sometimes. So this type of operation. Uh, is revised by Professor Martinet and a group of uh, authors. And I found this uh, review article uh, year 2020. And he concluded with his co-authors that the metatarsal head resection diabetic foot ulcer patient are correlated with significant complications, especially re-ulceration, as he has shown us today. So this is why I think this operation should go down and down with better offloading. Back to our patient we uh, decided to go for offloading with him and ask about the previous offloading and we found him to be on the worst inappropriate offloading we had and we are still having in the market, a hole below the hole. This type of ulceration, yes, we, uh, no problem. It, it usually causes more pressure on the ulcer and because you are surgeon, you are sending the offloading for those who are uh, not well experienced about offloading. This hole below the hole leads to bulging of the tissue and causes more edge effect on the ulcer with usually enlargement of the ulcer. A proper offloading study uh, a little bit about understanding the biomechanics without by that time uh, any uh, plantar pressure measurements that we do have now in our clinic, both on standing and on uh, kinetic, we didn't have that. But with a very simple biomechanic look at the foot of the patient we have, we do realize that his problem is that he is having very high arch with the metatarsal uh, bone uh, for for exposed for a very high pressure on it. And we did for him proper offloading by casting shoes. We are excellent in doing it in Mansoura. And a complete healing was achieved, as you see. And this way, because I usually use this uh, patient as an example and other lots of patients, before we do have our uh, complete CAD CAM system that we have now, for a computerized, the custom-made insole we are working with. Before that, I was usually the one responsible on doing this custom-made insoles for our patients manually, and it works. And when we do have, after that, we did have. 
the pressure system, I used to retest my patient what we are doing, and it was excellently perfect. So complete healing was achieved, and then the patient follow up with us monthly, as the recommendations say, previous ulceration or previous amputation, you should uh, see your patient each month. Then our patient dropped his visit, and because of our nurses, we knew from their colleagues in the university hospital that our patient died. He was 46 years, and he has very simple ulcer. No one can think that's going to be his cause of death. But by that time and since, now, and since then, we realized that it's not the whole. We should be caring about the whole. But it is not only the whole patient, as I'm going to conclude uh, very soon. The five-year mortality for diabetic foot ulcer is very high. It's even higher than breast cancer, for example. But it is as equal as all cases of reported cancer. And the direct cost is very huge, especially in our countries where the cost matter. And the impact of foot ulceration and amputation on uh, mortality is very high with some risk factors that make them more prone, uh, male sex, the age, and the presence of prefrontary disease, and the presence of renal disease. And there is a lot of paper about this with different types of independent risk factor. In this, for example, low albumin level was an increased cause for mortality. And then yesterday I searched diabetic foot ulcer mortality, and in less than one second, it came to be one near two million uh, publication about the mortality. To conclude, the multidisciplinary team for diabetic foot ulceration is essential because if you have a good one studying biomechanics and offloading, you are never going to do such a resection of the metatarsal head because it's never going to solve your problem the rate of ulceration is very high. And the second message is that offloading could never be underestimated as what's happening in Egypt market as a whole below the whole. It could never work like this. You need to think of the biomechanics, where to put fresher pressure on the foot of your patients to avoid the area of pressure rather than putting a hole. And diabetic foot ulcer appears not only to be a disease or a marker of poor health, they are in most of the research an independent risk factor associated with premature uh, deaths, as the same we have seen in our patients. And I might remind you all that while advances continues to improve the outcome, as we have seen in this very elegant uh, meeting and very excellent speakers, advances are present everywhere to talk about to, to manage the whole, but the whole population of diabetes is far away from this. And this is why the Egyptian Society of Diabetic Food with I chairing, uh, yani, we are spreading and we are working since more than 15 years now, 17 years we are working to spread the message that prevention is much, much more important than uh, caring about an ulcer or an ischemia and so on. Um, picking our patient early is our message, and I hope you transfer this for your patients to enter and have education from our site in Arabic. Thank you so much for that. Thank, thank you very much, Dr. Uh, Hanan, for the uh, excellent talk. Uh, now it's my pleasure to um, uh, welcome Dr. Uh, Professor Magdi Haggag, um, who will talk to us about plug shift during tibial angioplasty, a plea for innovative solution. Assalamu uh, alaikum. Plaque shift phenomena, the problem facing every one of us uh, during tibial angioplasty. Uh, this is Castrolani Hospital, the faculty I belong to, and I, I have no uh, potential conflict of interest. Uh, let us uh, imagine the tibial bifurcation is something like that. And when, if the road is clear, you go even with caution to select which one you will enter. But if the condition is dark, as tibioperoneal occlusive disease, 
you might face a problem during angioplasty. And if you use one balloon, you will end up in one way open and one way closed because of black shift phenomenon. Uh, this is a classic example of the black at the tibioperoneal or popliteotibial segment that float if you dilate one of the tibial vessels, it go to the other side, and if you open up the other side, it occlude the, the one. The infrapopliteal arterial occlusive disease is the major cause of ischemic foot, especially in diabetics. Osteal lesions represent a challenging problem during angioplasty. And as I said, the plaque shift re, uh, represent the most challenging problem during angioplasty. The popular treatment is the single balloon angioplasty, but uh, shift of the plaque into the adjacent untreated artery causing thrombosis, dissection, spasm, or even occlusion. Kissing balloon technique has been shown to be effective in avoiding this complication, but, how, but to do kissing balloon, uh, uh, it's a good option to overcome plaque shift and the axis by two wires and two balloons using large sheets if you go from the femoral axis or use double axis, one anti-grade and one retrograde from the tibial. And today I will talk about double anti-grade femoral axis technique. And uh, this will allow us to do kissing technique uh, in the tibial arteries in an easy way with no friction between the wires, and use two cars to go to two roads. Uh, the advantage of this technique, each port with its wire and balloon, free movement of wires and the balloon, and you can use any kind of balloons or wires, simultaneous casing balloon uh, angioplasty, and you can use jail balloon in one of the tibials during angioplasty of the other tibial, like the coronary done, uh, doing, and uh, you see the, the coronary, uh, I forget to tell you that cardiologists make a bifurcation club, bifurcation team club for the bifurcation uh, lesions in the coronaries. Uh, it's now to, uh, I think it's uh, now to do the, uh, it in peripheral vascular. Simultaneous kissing balloon angioplasty and PTA of all tibial vessels at the same time and avoid use of large sheaths. The disadvantage, fear of the puncture site, and it couldn't be used if thrombolytic therapy is indicated, and of course it's contraindicated in obese. Uh, let us go for the technique uh, by this example illustration. Dur and during uh, angioplasty, you, uh, at the access site, you selected the site of puncture of the, of the common femoral and you introduce the two wires of the two sheaths, and then you, int you introduce two sheaths like this. And you use each port to, you, uh, to go down to either to the anterior tibial with the tibio peroneal, or to uh, the posterior tibial and peroneal, or whatever, the two vessels adjacent to each other down there. This is the classic example of if you put the balloon in this area, it, it will dilate the tibial vessel, uh, this one, and the black shift will occlude the other. So the two wires at the same time and the two balloons at the same time will uh, do uh, angioplasty or do kissing balloon in, uh, in a manner like this, and you go all the way down to the tibial vessels. Uh, another example, so, uh, of course, and if you use coronary balloons, they are small balloons just for the ostium, but in the peripheral vascular, you can use any lens of balloons and you maintain uh, PTA all the way down to the tibial vessels. Uh, this is another example of this uh, technique. And of course, you can go all the way with the same, with the, with the sheath or the axis you used to the tibial vessels all the way down to the foot, and you end up with a good result. The early clinical experience, we did 10 cases of such technique. Uh, we succeeded to restore the beetle pulse with disappearance of the wrist pain and all the parameters we use in evaluation. The complications, only two small hematomas, 
uh, because the compression uh, doesn't uh, was not uh, 15 minutes. I recommend to uh, put compression at the femoral segment 15 minutes. And uh, six months follow up, there was one case with tibial occlusion and redo only by, by one she's succeeded to open up the tibial vessels. The conclusion, the double integrate femoral axis is a useful technique. It facilitates kissing technique in osteal tibial lesions. It helps free passage of wires and balloons during angioplasty. The concern of puncture site complication is minimum. And every time you are tempted to react in the same old way, ask, you, ask yourself first if you want to be a prisoner of the past or pioneer of the future. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Hagai, for the uh, excellent uh, case uh, presentation. Um, uh, now, um, it's my pleasure to uh, ask uh, Professor Mahmoud Salah to talk to us about hybrid endovascular retrograde metatarsal angioplasty, the HERMA technique in limb salvage. Excuse me. Oh, yes. OK. Um, thank you very much for the introduction. Thank you very much, Dr. Ahmad Taha, for the kind invitation. You know, always I love to be here. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, hybrid retrograde metatarsal angioplasty, what we call HERMA uh, technique. Uh, chronic total occlusion cases are increasing more and more in numbers and difficulties, especially rather four, five, and six with tissue loss. Peripheral angioplasty is the only hope to save part of the uh, foot. By time, among experienced uh, interventionalists, there is approved consensus of steps during angioplasty uh, procedure. First, usually we go through anti-grade axis, whether intraluminal or subentimal. If failed or perforated, so the second choice will be retrograde axis. But the question, what if retrograde axis failed? then we are uh, uh, in a mess. We adopted new technique called hybrid endovascular retrograde metatarsal angioplasty or the HERMA uh, technique. Uh, this HERMA technique includes surgical excision of the gangrenous tissue or amputation of the gangrenous toes. Then through the wound bed itself, sheathless access, you can access one of the digital uh, or the metatarsal uh, vessels using uh, 014 or even 018, manipulating the wire from the toes up till the lesion is crossed, then snaring the wire, and you can work as anti-grade uh, uh, regular. Some cases were completed from the digital or the metatarsal axis using two or three millimeter balloons, sheathless, of course, uh, for the infrapopletial uh, vessels, Examples of some cases, you can see this is a, a gangrenous uh, uh, toe, and then this is after we removed the toe. As you see, we did not complete the debridement, still the cartilage is there, and the heads of the metatarsals are there. You don't complete the uh, metatarsal, uh, the debridement, or you will not uh, find the uh, vessels. It's not working, I think. Yes, you can see the small vessel and then you can go through this small uh, vessel. And this is the balloon. This is the wire going to the uh, uh, metatarsal vessels. This is the uh, post-operative. This is after some weeks and this is complete healing. This is the video showing just how you can catch the 
small vessels from the wound and then you can uh, go by 014 wire and uh, of course you don't have complete control on this wire you don't know if this wire is going to the uh, uh, peroneal or will go to the anterior tibial uh, or posterior tibial you can see these are the uh, small uh, vessels this is again uh, had metatarsal, uh, metatarsal amputation, and then we had two wires and two uh, balloons. This wire and the balloon reached the dorsal speed uh, vessel, while the other one uh, reached the peroneal artery. Okay, this is the angioplasty I'm sorry for that yes this is after uh, some weeks of healing again after uh, amputating toe then you can go through this vessel Little toe was excised in another case. And this is the, uh, you can use cannula even to cannulate and then through the cannula you can put the wire. Just magnified field. So the results, we did 14 cases were done adopting this HERMA technique. 12 of them were very successful and could be crossed through the lesion. Two cases, the arch was heavily calcified and we could not uh, cross. Success rate was 86%. Of course, the number of cases is small, needs bigger number to be uh, really evaluated. Uh, but it was a successful uh, maneuver. In conclusion, when you are out of options in peripheral angioplasty case, remember this HERMA technique. Even if failed, no added complication to the procedure. It's considered as a bailout maneuver in very difficult situations to finish an essential procedure for angioplasty. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Salah, for, for an excellent uh, case series. Uh, now it's my pleasure to uh, invite uh, Professor Sharif Omar El, -El Kordawi uh, to be talking to us about pushing the limits from below the knee to below the ankle interventions. First of all, I would like to thank Professor Taha for this uh, wonderful meeting and for this uh, uh, great presentation I see today. Uh, today, actually, we'll talk about pushing the limits from uh, below knee intervention angioplasties to below the ankle interventions angioplasties. Uh, as an introduction, critical ischemia is considered the most severe challenge in degree of peripheral arterial disease and arterial vascularization is an effective treatment for saving limbs. Less invasive endovascular therapy is considered now the first line of treatment for the majority of the cases. Due to the controversy of the direct angiosomatic versus indirect revascularization, the question remained either the full correction concept will be the most beneficial for the patency rate and the clinical overcomes of these procedures. It is reported that the existence of a pedal artery disease results in a poor amputation-free survival rates, greater need for re-intervention and delay wound healing, uh, successful pedal artery vascularization may improve clinical outcomes of critical limb ischemia. Actually, we have a classification of the pedal R. And as we all know, we have uh, uh, four types of uh, pedal R. We have a complete pedal R and uh, complete anterior uh, dorsal speed is speed or arch without incomplete uh, posterior or uh, um, 
a plantar arch and the complete plantar arch with absent of dorsal species arch or absent complete absence of the arch. Actually, this classification is uh, made originally to just uh, simplify the arch types, but in our practice, we have a variant of uh, arch types more than this, and we can deal according each arch type. Um, Actually, when we have these uh, types of patients, when we have a complete tibial occlusion and uh, a poor uh, deserted foot, as we can see, uh, our main aim is a complete revascularization. Uh, this and this is what we called a success. Uh, I will uh, pass by three years. Uh, uh, through this presentation about uh, how we can deal with different type of R and what tools we can use and what uh, uh, types of intervention can be offered for the horse patient. Actually, when we have a complete posterior and a complete anterior R, this is a, a very lucky uh, patient. Uh, through this R, you can do many things. If you can... Uh, revascularize a retrograde vessel occluded, and through the plantar loop arch, you can complete your procedure by revascularizing the occluded uh, vessel uh, retrograde rather than anti-grade when you have a complete osteal occlusion and you cannot uh, demonstrate the, uh, the osteum of the vessel. So through this complete arch, you can go from one side, as we can see here, from the anterior tibial, and through the complete arch, you can go and path through and recanalize your posterior tibial artery in a retrograde manner. As we can see here, it's, it's a simple maneuver. It's neat, uh, a simple uh, manipulation of the balloons and wires, and this also can be achieved easily when you have a complete arch. This is the demonstration is how the wire passed and how you can finally re recanalize this patient with the when you have a complete arch. The uh, other things that when you have this, you will maintain a hemodynamic stable arch recanalization and the hemodynamic stable tibial also recanalization. Uh, another type of uh, pedal arch, when you have a complete posterior arch uh, plus incomplete anterior arch, you have to find a way just to make this uh, arch uh, hemodynamically sufficient to maintain a good circulation. So you have to figure out where to go. Uh, the <clears throat> as we can see here in this patient, we have a complete posterior arch incomplete anterior arch. Several trials have been reached to complete the anterior arch, but we cannot do this. So always remember to, you have another one, you can use the perineal arch just to maintain the hemodynamics of uh, the food circulation and to maintain a longer patency for your tibial angioplasty. Uh, as we can see here, we have a complete occlusion of anterior tibial and posterior tibial and the tibial perineal trunk. Uh, we use the same techniques, just an, uh, an, uh, uh, retrograde to transfemoral, to uh, integrate transfemoral, just to recanalize the full circulation of the foot through the uh, anterior tibial. It's incomplete with the posterior tibial, and then you go, go directly to the posterior tibial, recanalize the posterior tibial alone. And these types of arch are, are the most difficult. They are not complete and you have to recanalize each arch alone and wait for the results. You will find simply a, a, a connection at the end. So, but at the beginning you cannot uh, demonstrate this connection. So you have to go for each arch alone and recanalize each arch alone. And you will <laughs> regain the foot circulation Again, the full correction concept is the main concept that what we apply in our practice. Uh, and we mean by the full correction concept is the full recanalization of the three tibial vessels and foot arch uh, uh, revascularization. Here's the, uh, another technique about how we, you can deal with a heavily calcified arch and uh, you cannot even manipulate through this arch and uh, open this arch, which we call the deep venous arch recanalization. Uh, sometimes you have a patient like this, you have a good posterior tibial, but just be above, below the, above the ankle, and it stopped. There is no collateral, no arch, even trials to be done to revascularize this. 
Uh, actually, when we start these techniques, uh, it goes by a chance at the first couple of cases, and we started to know when to recanalize the deep venous arch and when not to do this, and how we can achieve a technique to do this. Actually, this is our technique in uh, doing this deep venous arterialization. You can use the balloon and inflate your balloon as an anchor, and through this anchor, you will have a possibility for your wire just to penetrate the arterial side and goes to the venous side, and through this, you will can go through the uh, venous R and recanalize the venous R and balloon everything, and then you will have a complete venous R uh, reverse vascularization. The uh, take-home message, the beadle arch angioplasty is a must, actually, in every baloney and angioplasty. Transbeadle revascularization is superior to retrograde puncture without damaging your target vessel. The full correction accelerates wound healing. Divinous arch arterialization might be your bailout for, uh, uh, for a patent arch. And always remember that calcification is always your enemy and hope to see you uh, soon next month in the IMEC. Thank you. Excellent talk, uh, Professor El Kordawi. Um, and now it's my pleasure again to uh, re-invite uh, Professor Salah back to the stage to talk to us about popliteal artery occlusive, occlusive lesion, a real challenge. We are all resigned. Thanks again, Dr. Hani. Uh, I'm going to give some uh, uh, cases about popliteal artery lesions, uh, really uh, challenging uh, lesion. This uh, is a popliteal artery aneurysm. This is a traumatic actually in origin. And when we had a lateral uh, uh, projection, the situation became more difficult. As you can see, there is aneurysm and occlusion of the popliteal artery. So uh, by hook or crook, we could not pass from uh, anti-grade uh, from above, and we had to go uh, from uh, down as uh, retrograde. So this is the retrograde axis. We went through the uh, anterior tibial artery. And this is snaring from uh, uh, the femoral axis. Uh, thanks God, we managed to cross the uh, aneurysm from uh, below, and we uh, did this uh, snaring. Then we did ballooning of the popliteal artery. We put one supera. And as you see, still the aneurysm is uh, filling, but at least we have popliteal artery uh, here. Uh, this is double supera uh, stent uh, with some packing. The stent, uh, uh, the super stent was uh, put inside the first one. And the question why we didn't actually use a covered stent in this uh, case inside the supera and the answer is very simple uh, it was not available so we had to do this uh, this is the uh, final angio after the uh, double supera still the aneurysm is uh, filling but in a very uh, low uh, flow compared to the uh, first uh, one this is another case this is complete uh, popliteal artery uh, occlusion. We could manage to uh, cross the uh, lesion with uh, uh, wire supported by uh, the balloon to the anterior tibial artery. And then we uh, did ballooning of the, once we did ballooning, uh, started to see the mouse of the tibio perineal uh, trunk, and then we could manage to go through the tibio perineal trunk. And then we did, we put a supera uh, stent again, and uh, the final angio was this one.
something is wrong with this i think yes this is the final angio you can see it's very nice uh, result this is another case we have complete occlusion of the popliteal uh, artery uh, maybe the pictures was uh, yeah, is not very clear but uh, the calcification was very uh, heavy this is another uh, view we managed to cross with the wire and we used uh, a thorectomy device. This is the jet stream. And uh, this is the, without using any balloon, just after the uh, jet stream. And this is the, uh, uh, you see we had some AV fistula, but after we did uh, the stenting, it uh, disappeared. This is the supera again for the uh, lesion. This is another case. This is a, a patient had a, a total knee replacement, and after the total knee replacement, he had a pulsating swelling, and the CT angio showed a popliteal artery aneurysm, and this was the uh, angio, and this is after the we put a, a covered stent. Uh, this is a popliteal artery aneurysm, was also uh, uh, treated by covered uh, stent. Actually, we use both. We put a, a supera stent, and inside we put the covered stent, because the covered stent alone will not be uh, uh, suitable in uh, uh, knee joint. This is uh, this is a case we had a popliteal artery aneurysm that had stenting before, and uh, uh, recurrence was uh, uh, very uh, heavy, and we had this heavy, uh, very large. Uh, popliteal aneurysm, and you can see the covered stent inside. You can see the there was no chance to do any endovascular uh, procedures again, and uh, just saphenous bypass was put. You can see this is the saphenous bypass. In conclusion, popliteal artery is one of the most tricky arteries. Uh, uh, maybe the only vessel that carries very high risk of gangrene uh, if it is occluded, because sometimes you have occlusion of the femoral artery and still the uh, foot is okay. Sometimes the iliac is occluded and still, but the popliteal is very uh, tricky. And to work in this area, we must have a wide range of materials, a lot of endovascular tricks, and many uh, out-of-the-box uh, solutions. Thank you very much. Again, thank you, uh, Professor Salah, for more uh, interesting cases. Um, I think we'll uh, probably move to um, uh, the next speaker. May I invite uh, Professor um, Ayman Rifat? No? Uh, right. Uh, so, so maybe until um, he's ready, uh, may I invite uh, uh, Professor Khaled Chaoui uh, to the stage uh, uh, to talk to us about difficult situation in crural angioplasty? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I mean, thanks to the uh, organizing committee, especially uh, my professor, Dr. Ahmad Taha, for kind invitation to uh, share in the Diabetic Food Care Meeting 2022. Uh, my presentation is a uh, difficult situation in rural angioplasty. First case is a female patient, 74 years old, diabetic ischemic heart disease, hypertensive renal impairment, 
complaint from gangrene of the uh, left uh, big toe and uh, second toe. Uh, investigation uh, was done, revealed there is uh, atherosclerotic uh, occlusion of the infrapopletial uh, uh, arteries. Uh, uh, due to renal impairment, we do angioplasty using carbon dioxide, left uh, anti grade femoral uh, axis, no significant stenosis, uh, diffused atherosclerosis of uh, superficial femoral artery, popliteal uh, artery, and uh, complete occlusion of the uh, posterior tibial coronial arteries with no uh, distal off in these uh, two vessels. Only uh, the artery to the foot is anterior tibial artery with uh, proximal occlusion of the anterior uh, tibial uh, artery. Uh, so uh, we go to the uh, treatment of the uh, angioplasty treatment with a proximal part of the uh, occlusion in the anterior tibial artery. We are, we are using uh, YR018, and after many trials from the anti grade axis, we failed to uh, go interluminal post the uh, occlusion uh, site. So uh, we uh, go to the retrograde, uh, uh, retrograde uh, axis puncture, the anterior tibial artery more distal, and uh, using uh, YR018 uh, uh, wire we can uh, pass uh, the lesion and uh, complete the dilatation using uh, balloon dilatation, three millimeter, uh, 200 millimeter. And uh, after that, uh, post dilatation using drug, uh, eluting balloon, three millimeter and 150 millimeter. And this is the uh, final angiography in this case with good flow uh, through the anterior tibial to the uh, dorsal speed artery and uh, foot arch. Uh, then uh, deployment of the big and second toe amputation, repeated dressing with back and the result after two months. Uh, second case, it's a male patient with uh, gangrene and uh, uh, and, and dorsum of the foot. Uh, we do uh, angio, uh, angiography, the primary angiography shows there is occlusion of the uh, infrapopletial arteries, complete occlusion of the posterior tibial artery and, and uh, peroneal artery, uh, patent proximal uh, part of the anterior tibial artery with no this runoff uh, distally in the uh, leg, only uh, collaterals. Uh, decision was to uh, do a trial of angioplasty in the anterior tibial artery using wire 018. We go to the anterior tibial artery, but fortunately we, uh, unfortunately we can't pass the more distal than the patent part in the anterior tibial artery. And then we try to do a retrograde axis from the uh, pedal uh, artery or distal anterior tibial artery. And we succeed to do the retrograde axis, but using the wire from the retrograde axis, we can't go back again in the uh, truly human proximal to the uh, lesion. Uh, we do several trials using balloon uh, from anti-grade axis and balloon from the retrograde axis, uh, hoping to uh, do uh, to open uh, channels in the, these dissections to can pass the uh, occlusion uh, site. We failed to do that. And this is the angiography after uh, this trial. There is no improvement and, the dif and no difference in the uh, angio uh, preoperative than post the procedure. Uh, due to it, this is the only option for this patient. There is no surgical option. We do another trial for angioplasty one week uh, later. And uh, when do angiography, we uh, found that the anterior tibial proximal part is patent and mid-segment in the leg also is patent. And uh, we have, uh, uh, we think that this uh, promising angioplasty, uh, to, uh, to do angioplasty again with no uh, distal in the, uh, the anterior tibial artery in the distal and the foot. So we do angioplasty, but, uh, Unfortunately, the wire using wire 018, we pass the uh, upper uh, the, uh, proximal segment and mid segment of the anterior tibial artery and the distal segment, but the wire is stopped at the ankle and not entered the foot in the speedis artery. 
uh, we're using uh, many trials, balloon dilatation to anchor the wire and negotiate more the wire, but the wire no uh, move upward, uh, sorry, no uh, move uh, uh, downward in the pedal artery. So uh, we do again uh, retrograde uh, access from the pedal artery and using wire uh, O18 and uh, we uh, success to pass the, this uh, segment and the lesion and snare it from the anti-grade and complete the uh, angiogra uh, angioplasty from the anti-grade uh, axis, dilatation of the pedal artery and dilatation of the anterior tibial artery. Uh, and then this is the uh, final uh, angiography after the procedure, a good flow in the anterior tibial artery down to the uh, pedal artery and down to the uh, foot. Many thanks for your uh, attention. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Professor Shawi. Um, and now um, I would like to invite uh, Professor Mahmoud Nasser, uh, um, who will talk to us about pulseless, sheathless femoral axis, a way to treat difficult combined iliac and SFA lesion. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, many thanks to our organizing committee and especially Professor Ahmad Taha for giving me opportunity to present this case. So I am uh, associate professor in vas uh, vascular surgery in Cairo University Hospital, which is uh, one of the biggest uh, hospitals in Egypt, more than 6,000 uh, beds with uh, uh, 70 uh, bed for all, only for vascular surgery. And we are doing more than 40 to 50 cases per week including uh, trauma uh, and the peripheral arterial disease and different aspects of vascular surgery. We are doing uh, many cases like this complex case of uh, aortoiliac disease uh, uh, with uh, task D and the iliac angioplasty and the stenting with good results and another case of CRAP technique for aortoiliac disease. Uh, but my case is different case. I, I want to... Uh, show a different uh, concept. Uh, my case is 78 years old, a frail comorbid patient with diabetes, hypertension, heavy smoker, uh, CKD with creatinine 2.2, and ischemic heart disease with ejection fraction 33%, presented with uh, gangrenous old tip of toes on the right side with severe wrist pain, with edema of the foot and uh, 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 some type of flexion deformity, but it is uh, correctable, and asymptomatic left lower limb. Uh, and this is a duplex angiogram showing the ectasia of the distal aorta 2.6 with mural thrombus, complete occlusion of left iliac axis, and occluded external iliac heavily calcified and the flush SFA. So my plan was to do a transbrachial angioplasty, keeping the long sheath in the common iliac artery and trying to manipulate the external iliac artery from above. But I couldn't tackle the lesion due to uh, the shape of the cap of the occlusion. And uh, the other axis is distal bypass for uh, distal axis from the posterior tibial artery, which uh, was uh, 2.6 millimeter. And so can, I can upgrade to six different sheets. The options for the patient was aorto femoral or femoropopletial bypass or staged iliac stenting, but the patient refused any risk of general anesthesia. So the condition uh, done under complete uh, local anesthesia, transbrachial access coming from the above, and I tried to tackle the lesion from above, but I couldn't. So I tried uh, from the right common femoral, pulseless, sheathless with common wire supported with uh, 2.5 uh, semi-inflated balloon to cross the lesion. And after multiple trials and uh, of combined anti-grade and retrograde, Recanalization, I finally uh, succeeded in passing the lesion from blue. Then I snared the wire from the anti-grade brachial axis. 
So I got now wire from brachial axis flows to the right groin, and I started uh, balloon angioplasty. Then I succeeded in complete recanalization of the external iliac artery, and you can notice uh, just filling in uh, incomplete filling of the right femoral due to compression of the axis because it is sheathless. After removal, you can see complete flow to the common femoral artery. Now it's uh, angiogram for the SFA. This wire is outside the body from the groin. So I started a uh, duplex guided retrograde axis from posterior tibial and I succeeded in uh, pre canalization of the flush SFA lesion. And now I have two wires, wire coming from the posterior tibial, uh, going upward to the uh, iliac. And I started balloon inflation, and the other wire is outside the body. Then stent insertion for the external iliac, and the post stent dilatation. The result is a nice, complete opacification of common femoral and the SFA dilatation showed nice flow to the popliteal and I get at that time good pulse with no dissection and no indication of stenting for SFA, so I did a uh, drug-coated balloon for the SFA with very nice result and the good flow to the foot. The brightment for the patient is done with transmetatarsal, but the stump is necrotic, so I revised the wound again with the brightment and the under uh, sciatic block, so this is the result after the brightening and the back therapy, and this is the end result. Take-home message, endovascular first option should be adopted in high-risk comorbid frail patients. Balsalis sheathless femoral axis is safe and feasible in combined cases of iliac and the SFA with high technical success. Thank you so much. Um, thank you very much for, for this excellent uh, case presentation. Um, uh, I would like to now um, invite uh, Professor Wael Shalen uh, to talk to us about the supera stent as a bailout procedure for infragenicular interventions, a challenging case presentation. Okay. Uh, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Uh, I would like to uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to thank Professor Taha for the kind invitation and world-class meeting. Um, I'll be presenting a challenging case of uh, infragenicular endovascular uh, uh, revascularization of a patient with task D femoral lesion. Our patient uh, is a 64 years old male patient who is a smoker, diabetic, hypertensive with ischemic heart disease. Past medical history is significant for right big toe amputation 10 years ago and left above knee amputation four years ago, meaning he is, this patient has a, a precious limb. Presented with ischemic wrist pain and gangrene of the big toe uh, amputation stump, as well as the second, third, and fifth toe gangrene. On examination, has only femoral pulse with absent popliteal and tibial pulsations. This puts the patient into category, uh, rather fourth category five, with an ABI of 0 0.4. This patient has a dubless uh, scanning that shows total chronic occlusion of the distal half of the popliteal artery with occlusion of the proximal anterior tibial artery, tibial perineal trunk, and posterior tibial artery re, uh, reconstituted the middle third of the posterior tibial, as well as occlusion of the uh, plantar arch, deep plantar arch. We decided to have a diagnostic angiogram with the intent to treat, and the patient has what's called blind popliteal artery, occlusion of P2 and P3 segment, and occlusion of the origins and the proximal segments of the anterior tibial, tibial perineal trunk, and reconstituted peroneal artery and distal anterior tibial artery while the posterior tibial and deep plantar arch were uh, very much attenuated. Uh, by task uh, classification, this patient uh, uh, falls into task D lesion, which is occlusion of the obliteal artery and the origins of the tibial vessels. So we decided to pass the lesion, cross the lesion with V18 wire, in the, uh, through the popliteal occlusion and into the anterior tibial artery, 
and then we pass the balloon for angioplasty with selective angiography to confirm the distal uh, runoff vessel, which is the anterior tibial artery, and we did an angioplasty of the whole uh, segment occluded. And this is the result of the balloon angioplasty, a very nasty flow-limiting uh, dissection, including the uh, distal popliteal segment as well, at the origin of the anterior tibial artery, as well as uh, jeopardizing the origins of the tibioperoneal trunk, posterior tibial, and peroneal artery. So what to do now for this nasty uh, dissection? We try to pass two wires, one in the anterior tibial and the other in the posterior tibial to angioplasty uh, the, the dissection and to fix it and as well as to preserve the uh, origins of the tibial vessels. But uh, this uh, didn't work and we did a diagnostic angiogram that shows non-visualization of popliteal artery and the tibial vessels. So the next step we decided to put uh, a superior stent after withdrawing the wire in the anterior tibial and keeping the one in the posterior tibial, the first superior stent was the deployed, uh, size 5.5 by 100 millimeter, and it reached up to the mid popliteal segment and the arrow points to the end of the first popliteal uh, superior stent. And then we telescoped the second one through the first one. The size was 4.5 millimeter, and it reached to the tibioperoneal trunk. And we did an angiogram after the deployment of the second superior stent uh, to see the, uh, the, the dissection and the distal runoff. And then we proceeded with angioplasty of the posterior tibial artery into the deep plantar arch. And this is the completion angiogram that showed uh, perfectly patent uh, popliteal artery and the runoff into two vessels, the posterior tibial and the peroneal, and the patent plantar arch, deep plantar arch. The patient uh, relieved his ischemic pain. Uh, the ABI improved from 0 0.4 to uh, 0 0.85. And we did for him transmetatarsal amputation. And you can appreciate the vascularity of the flaps. So the question now, what is the long-term outcome of the superior stent? When reviewing the literature, femoropletial interventions account for more than 55% of peripheral disease. And the stents in this segment have historically been associated with stent fracture, wrist stenosis, and decreased primary patency during long-term follow-up. Regarding superior stent, it's a peripheral stent system, a braided self-expanding nitinol stent that was designed to withstand and, uh, the unique torsional and compressive stressors along the course of the femoral rotial artery, especially at the knee joint level. It comes pre-mounted on an over-the-wire delivery system through six French or seven French sheaths compatible with 0, uh, 014 and 018 guide wires, and it's manufactured in different sizes, 4.5, 5.5, and 6.5, with a stent lenses reaching 15 centimeters. Multiple studies have reported on the uh, use of superior stent in this difficult to treat uh, segment, which is the retrogenicular popliteal artery, and showed an excellent uh, patency rate at one year, reaching up to 80%, with 0% stent fracture rate. And when compared to other uh, self-expandable uh, stent platforms, it shows comparable favorable results of primary patency rate, but much uh, better stent fracture, uh, percent of stent fracture rate, which are reaching to 0%. Despite this encouraging data, uh, some reports have been published uh, about stent fracture of the superior stent, and the first was published in the Journal of Vascular and Endovascular Therapy, 2017, where the stent fractured after three months, and they had to do repeat angioplasty to fix the stenosis. The limitations of such studies regarding the superior includes the data are gathered from retrospective studies. There is no prospective study, short-term follow-up periods, one-year follow-up only, medium-length lesions, and no head-to-head -head direct comparisons with other stent platforms, nor with angioplasty alone. So my take-home message for, uh, from this uh, challenging case and the review of the literature, for complex endovascular interventions, plan B should be available for better limb salvage. Superior stent might have a bailout option for complex infragenicular endovascular interventions with acceptable one-year patency rate and lower stent fracture rate. And prospective studies with long-term follow-up are required for better judgment on the outcome of such self-expandable stents. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much for this uh, excellent case uh, presentation. Um, now, uh, I would like to invite uh, uh, Professor Mohammed Enedi uh, to talk to us uh, about in diabetic foot management, never give up, which is probably something we all agree with. Uh, Okay. Uh, my talk today about diabetic foot not to give up 
it is not about ischemic cases it is about infected cases and the chronic ones and the many thanks to dr ahmed Taha about this invitation uh, to uh, express my work chronic in diabetic patient is an uh, a bomb time bomb can explore in any time first case Neobasic ulcer in young lady for nine months, infection, deep seated, extend to the lateral aspect, deprived it along with the track of infection and the extensive deprivement to the narcotic tissue. After many dressing, I, uh, I noticed that the uh, thickness of the of bone is increased. There is develop, it develops a sharp joint. And I did a plain X ray. I found that, and I wear long air cast. After many dressing, it's okay, healed. Best move fits in the right time. When there is a neobasic ulcer after uh, uh, amputation of one of the tooth for two and a half years, you must think about surgical offloading to close this wound because you must avoid infection and explosion of the bomb. And the end result after uh, removal of the head of the metatarsal. Another wound after amputation of a two, there is a, a post amputation uh, ulcer for two years. I remove all of this, all of this bone and close the wound primary and it has ended the problem of this patient. Next patient, the chronic wound in the uh, plantar aspect, infection, extend to the dorsum, amputation of the included two, with dressing, problem is solved. Another wound, chronic wound in the heel, with extension of the infection to the dorsum of the foot, deprivement, and I did blend X-ray, I found charcoal, and I do a long air cast, complete healing of the wound. My conclusion, another one can occur also in post metatarsal amputation, this deviation of the metatarsal bone, there is ulcer like this. I remove one of the bone to allow touch of the heel to the ground and this is the final result and the close the problem of this patient. My conclusion, chronicond in a diabetic foot is a time bomb. Surgical solution for this wound must be considered. Conservative treatment should not be extended beyond months. Proper management of diabetic foot and more experience about how to divide. Repeated foot X-ray every two weeks is, a, is valuable for detection of early charcoal. I think it is an early air cast wearing is recommended in extensive and deep foot infection after proper debridement. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for, for the nice presentation. Um, then we'll probably move to, um, may I invite uh, Professor Ahmed Naga? to uh, talk to us about the diabetic atherosclerotic plaque going from below is the safest route. Assalamu uh, Thank you, uh, Professor Hatta, for the very kind invitation. And uh, I'm happy uh, you're back to the uh, active uh, scientific uh, meetings. And I hope the next uh, years, inshallah, will, uh, will be even better than the past. Uh, I will briefly give a quick presentation about uh, the diabetic atherosclerotic plaque and going retrograde. Uh, these are the issues I will try to cover in the next few minutes. Why do we do a retrograde approach? when to do it, what's the evidence behind that, how to do it, and then we'll come to a conclusion. So why retrograde? Um, as you're all aware of, 
mostly the proximal uh, cap of the atherosclerotic plaque is usually hard, rounded, calcific, and it usually pushes the wire preferentially into the profunda artery, uh, or it may enforce the wire to go to make a loop and go subintimately, something that we are not always um, uh, want to do it. So uh, usually the distal uh, end of the, uh, the atherosclerotic plaque is uh, mostly tapered, as you can see, and um, theoretically it would allow the wire to go uh, through lumen. So when to do a retrograde in patients with a hostile groin, difficult inflow anatomy, and uh, when you're going uh, from above anti-grade, doing a sub approach, and you feel that the re-entry will be too far from the uh, sub dis dissection, and you have to angioplasty long segment, uh, something which is um, associated with decreased patency. So what's the evidence behind the retrograde approach? Um, I was surprised to, uh, to, to see in the literature that it has been mentioned in 1988 um, in the Cardiovascular uh, and Intervention Radiology uh, Journal. And since then, too many publications have been there. Um, this is a recent publication uh, last year, a systemic review of the retro uh, peritoneal approach. And they concluded that uh, an ipsilateral retrograde approach to fempop lesions has good primary technical success and low rate of complications. They also stated that it has a promising role as a bailout technique as well, of course, but also as a primary access technique in complex lesion. But still, its superior superiority uh, over anti-grade approach is questionable. So how to do a retrograde? I will just um, uh, show you some cases. Uh, first case is a patient who presented with the critical limb ischemia, uh, chronic total occlusion of the uh, distal SFE at the adductor canal, uh, heavily calcific lesion, as you can see. Tried to go traditionally from above, couldn't cannulate the lesion uh, with different wires. Then we took a picture below the knee. We found a decent anterior tibial artery. I managed to uh, cannulate the anterior tibial just under the CR and then putting the wire from below going um, sub intimately and then we managed to um, cannulate the sheath, six French sheath put in the common femoral artery and then I pushed the wire from below up to the sheath, took it out of the, the skin and then the procedure would uh, proceed traditionally from above doing angioplasty. Balloon angioplasty for the whole uh, femoral face segment using a uh, five millimeter long balloon. This is the primary uh, result. Not quite happy uh, with the dissection. So we decided to do another uh, round of uh, angioplasty with the same balloon again, leaving it for a, a longer period. And this is the uh, final result. Still some acceptable dissection, if I can say, and total uh, recondition of the distal end with good runoff at the anterior tibia at the puncture site. Um, this video shows, uh, it's from the outside, shows how uh, would I um, pull the wire uh, from below? So uh, after the wire is uh, after the wire is in the sheath, I would uh, pull the sheath uh, a bit by bit uh, while the assistant is pushing the wire from below. And at the moment I see the wire coming out of the skin, I would hold it and pull it up. As you can see, maintaining pressure over the common femoral artery. Uh, and it, it is very important to uh, ask the assistant to uh, keep the wire, uh, hold the wire from below, as you can see. And this is what we call the flossing uh, technique. Uh, wire going from below and taken uh, through the common femoral artery uh, above. And then I would put the six French sheath again from above to uh, proceed traditionally with an anti-grade angioplasty.
Uh, second case is a similar case with the calcific heart lesion at the adductor canal on the right SFA. Uh, again, I tried traditionally from above, as you can see, a bit of extravasation. So uh, we took a picture below the knee, good anterior tibial. Uh, I stick the, uh, the needle into the anterior tibial uh, just after the takeoff from the popliteal artery, uh, push the wire from below, and as you can see, you might keep the user sheath, five French sheath from below. You might take out the sheath and just leave the wire. And as you can see, this patient has got a hostile groin. It was very difficult to cannulate and the, the, the confirm it from above. Um, then uh, once I have the wire in the popliteal artery, uh, as you can see, going from the anti-grade approach, I would proceed normally with the rune angioplasty. This is the proximal. Uh, SFA, distal SFA. Uh, third case is a patient whom I did uh, fem pop uh, bypass several years ago, and he came uh, with the other uh, leg, and he needed a fem pop bypass, but, but actually he refused to have any kind of uh, open bypass. Um, and he had flush SFA occlusion, uh, which was very difficult to cannulate from above. So I decided to open the uh, popliteal artery uh, the P1 segment, supragenically, and I uh, stick the uh, sheath uh, into the artery. Sorry, I don't have the uh, pictures be, uh, before angioplasty. This is a long balloon through the common femoral SFA, popliteal, and that's the final result, proximal SFA, distal SFA, and it went fine. Last case is just a, v a quick video to show that sometimes you can go through the, the po posterior tibial artery at the ankle level, and this is even much easier than the anterior tibial, which I showed uh, now, uh, because the artery here is palpable uh, and superficial just behind the medium malleolus. Specifically, this patient, I, uh, this is a picture of his leg after, as you can see, multiple trials uh, for puncture. And afterwards, uh, the artery uh, had a spasm at the site of puncture, which was uh, relieved spontaneously afterwards. Uh, in conclusion, um, the retrograde approach is a very good second line procedure. Can I have just 30 seconds, please? You can go, uh, you can uh, go through the popliteal, keeping the, uh, the patient supine or prone. The prone position, of course, carries higher incidence of uh, venous and nerve uh, injuries, uh, and it could be cumbersome for the patient. Uh, and uh, or you can go through the tibials as we just mentioned. You can go ultrasound guided, and this is uh, could be better than uh, the fluoroscopic guided uh, technique which I did. Or you could use a, a Doppler equipped smart needle, which I uh, am not aware of of it being present uh, present in Egypt. Uh, you can go uh, either true lumen or sub intimately, and as regards the puncture site, you can either do manual compression. Uh, you can either do manual compression, use a closure device, or direct repair if you uh, fail to, or balloon dilatation. And wh what I did actually at the end of the procedure, I, I put a balloon inside the artery, and you keep it for two or three minutes, and this usually seals the hole in the artery. Thank you. Thank you very much um, for the excellent talk. Um, I think we'll go back again to... Um, uh, Professor uh, Ahmad Khuleif uh, to talk to us about charcoal foot case presentation. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you all for inviting me. Special thanks to my dear friend, Professor Ahmad Taha, for inviting me to this uh, very interesting uh, meeting. Uh, now I'm going to t talk to you about a different aspect. I mean, I have been seeing you are going through the vessels. We are the orthopedic surgeons. We know just we our way is to go, when to go to the bone. Between the skin and the bone is something which is not <laughs> up to us. <laughs> anyway, so I, I do lots of feet and I'm going to talk to you about a, a patient. Uh, he's a, a Sudanese engineer. He is 71 years old, uh, male. He's been diabetic for 37 uh, years. He presented with a sharp ankle, ankle and marked deformity. He was sent to me actually from Sudan. He had several trials of failed ankle arthrodesis, 
after ankle fracture about one year ago. So he has been going, he has got a shark 37 years, diabetic uh, neuropathy, loss of sensations. This is uh, the, how the picture started with. Uh, in these patients when, uh, with uh, Charcot and with uh, diabetes, we just think about having a very secure fixation. So we, I don't know, we usually do plates and screw, but in these cases, we do some things like intramedullary nails. So we go by a nail directly from the heel, subtalar joint to the ankle joint. This will offer the patient a very good uh, amount of stability because the patient needs to be standing on his hand. And the case is sometimes if you have even infections, if you provide your patient with stability, this will help to, uh, to secure and to improve the infection. However, this patient has this operation done. Unfortunately, it did not work and the things, and he went and it failed. So, and he had infection. He had infection, severe infection was pus coming out from the entry of the nail. We put the nail from the heel up. So I don't know if you know this frame, we call it Elizaro frame, lots of circles around the foot and the it's like a wheel with circles in uh, KY's intention. So we make it like a fixator, external fixator. And again, this patient ended up with infection and he failed to respond to the treatment. And he came to me this way, you can see his foot on, on his side and he's walking as if his foot is walking with his foot beside it's not under the ankle anymore. It went very, very uh, lateral. This is his foot put on the table. You can see here in the CT scan with 3D uh, reconstruction. You can see this is the tibia, and you can see here the foot is not beside it. You can see, here. You can see the lateral medullus, and his, his, you can see the medulli, and this is the foot. So he is walking actually with his, this is the tibia, and the foot is just beside him. I just wanted to know, I mean, you know, this is a severe problem, severe problem. You know, whenever you choose a way, you go the wrong way. You choose a nail and it didn't work. You choose an Elizarov and it did not work. So why, what went wrong? Choice of the fixation method. I've been choosing this fixation like intramedullary nail for ages. It didn't work. Fixation technique. Technique was not that bad, actually. He went uh, well. Post-operative care, this patient is an engineer and he's very well educated. So I thought, what, what went wrong with him? I mean, you know, there is something which went wrong. Actually, when I thought this, I thought, I thought of my vascular surgeon's colleague. This patient, I, I asked it for angiography for him. So I went away from this Charcot as an orthopedic surgeon, and I discovered that he has got marked ischemia of the limb, which resulted every way we do an operation, it fails, every way. So I sent him for angioplasty. He had the angioplasty done. Of course, this previous operation has utilized everything. This is an intraoperative x-ray. You can see uh, how I did. I, did, I just do, did two approaches, one on the medial side and one on the lateral side. I have done a release of the uh, soft tissues and I brought the foot again under the ankle and I put these three cannulated screws, these are four cannulated screws. This is very helpful in fixation of the patient. Now we can see in the post-operative period, now you can see these two incisions and you can see very good alignment of the patient and things went very well. This is after uh, two months post-operative. I just put him in like protective cast, but you can see the foot is again under the heel. And again, this is a follow-up X-ray. This is his foot, how it looks like he's standing up on it. Uh, I don't know how to run this video. This is a video where he is walking on the uh, foot. I... Anyway. Very stable, he is able to walk on it. I mean, he lost one too. I mean, this should has been uh, uh, made, made someone who to think about what's going wrong. Usually before, he did not use to work like that. He was just walking with the foot just on his uh, side. So it's very stable and he is very well uh, knowing now. And that's him. He gave me a nice present after he went very well. And uh, thanks God, it went very well. Uh, another case, this is another page just to keep, keep the principle. Stability is the most important thing. You can see an ulcer on the medial side, very unstable foot. The foot is very unstable. 
you can see again how the amount of bony destruction which is present in the foot in the ankle there is actually no talus just a small part of the calcaneus and even the, we lost the junction between the forefoot and the hind foot you can see here there is a line so even the forefoot is separated from the hind foot again this is a 3d this is what i call the patient walking with the foot beside him just it is like that very challenging and of course you have an ulcer on the medial side because the medial malleus is just under the skin and you can see this is amount of bone loss this is after doing the operation again i do double approaches media and lateral because you need to just take make traction of the uh, foot and pull it down and of course i needed to actually fix the forefoot to the hind foot uh, this is all minimally invasive so i actually I just open and bring it up. I just put a guide wire like you do for the catheters, but inside, instead of the balloon, I put a screw. So it is something which is, uh, gives us a very good stability. And this is him. You can see the foot is back again under uh, the uh, leg. Uh, this is my message to you. Thank you again for inviting me. I, I hope it was a bit clear, a bit away from you. But always for an orthopedic surgeon, you need to have the best friend is a vascular surgeon. This is how it saves your life sometimes. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. This is excellent. I don't know whether uh, Dr. Ayman Rifat is, is here. No, he's not. Right. Okay. So, so I, I think this, this brings us to the end. Can I, uh, may I invite all the speakers to come back to the stage, please? It's been a very exciting stage, and I'm bombarded with questions. Yes. So, so there, there are loads and loads of questions uh, for each one of you, which, which is effectively a reflection that these are very exciting and interesting uh, cases. If I pass you, that's that thank features, you, sir. Right, and uh, Professor Hagag. So, so I have to apologize because um, um, Dr. Hanan couldn't stay, so we can't uh, take any questions for her, and I can't see the Professor Hagag as well. He's gone. Okay, right. Um, so. Maybe start with uh, Professor Salah, because you gave two talks, so maybe just take, take one at a time. Um, so the first question is actually from my co-moderator, Dr. Uh, Duffer Kamel, uh, regarding the first, first uh, case. Um, uh, and the question is whether you think there is an increased risk of introducing infection uh, if you pass the wire from a potentially infected field? Uh, well, actually, uh... We did not have uh, uh, spreading infection from this because actually you, you, you remove the gangrenous tissue and most of the cases were not heavily infected, was ischemic. Right. And just get the any bleeding point that can be just a, a yeah. mouse that just, just we answer, we didn't have uh, right. spreading okay. infection in this. Th that's very sensible. So another question from Professor um, Hisham Sharaf, and the question is, if you fail to get access surgically, um, do you try ultrasound or fluoroscopic guidance to try to get access maybe more proximally in the RT? Well, this is actually, you do after you fail everything. Yeah, After right. you fail okay. to get any retrograde, then you... Yes. So you do that think at about the time. this technique. Right. And I think there were a couple of questions. I think people have the same uh, sort of thinking. Um, um, and, and this is a question from uh, Dr. Uh, Mahmoud Atif. And, and I think I had the same idea as well. So what would you do after you take the toe off and then you can't access or you can't recanalize your arch effectively? You haven't improved the, the blood supply to the foot. Do you stop or do you go for more sort of extensive amputation? Well, usually you can find something. If you cannot find uh, just removing the toe, you can go a little bit uh, deeper. Right. And any uh, bleeding point, uh, don't try to uh, cauterize or uh, okay. use it as a mouse to cannulate and put 0 for T1. Right. And if you have to extend your amputation, do you do it at the same time or you stage it like you sit tight on no, it? No, no, same time. Same, same time. time. Just uh, remove the gangrenous tissue. Don't complete the debridement because right. otherwise you will not find. Okay, just remove yes. uh, the minimum and then try to get uh, something. If you cannot go a little bit deeper till you have a real sure. bleeding point and then you can use it. Right. Okay, that's excellent. <laughs> I'm sorry, it's a lot of questions. So, so I just, <laughs> I'm, I'm asking on behalf of, of the crowd. So let me move to Professor uh, Sharif Omar, if I may. 
Um, so the first question is from co my co-moderator, Dr. Uh, Darfur Kamel. Uh, uh, the question, and actually it was repeated as well, what tools and what size balloons do you use for your PDA revascularization? Uh, actually, the tools are uh, ranging from O18 wires and O14 wires. Basically, O18 wires and sometimes use O14 wires for heavily calcified when yeah. you need to go transluminal without having a large loop just not to you know, uh, lose your uh, digital vessels. And the balloons, mainly uh, two millimeter balloons are enough for arch. Right. Um, in some males, when you have a larger vessel, 2.5 millimeter balloons are also uh, might be used. Right. And do you use any support, particular support catheters if your balloons don't Yes, cross? Uh, actually I use a trailblazer catheter uh, and the uh, TXI. This okay. is the uh, most used, yes. Um, and, and from sort of experience, these arches are very susceptible to spasm. Do you routinely give any vasodilators no, during never, the procedure? Never, never. never. And you never had any spasm no. post that? No, you will have spasm. You yes. will have spasm. Sure. But just wait yeah. without doing anything. Yeah. I'll never use any uh, you don't. for this. If, even prophylactically, you don't no, start no, no, with... No, never. Okay, right. And, and, and may I ask, um, I don't know whether Dr. Katsanos is still in the audience or run away. Or maybe Dr. Taha. For, for those ones, do you do you give routinely any um, just just to open it to to, to to everyone? Do you routinely give any uh, vasodilators or anticoagulation? Yeah, so long the patient's blood pressure is in a normal or high range, I'm not afraid at all of having, of giving the patient a, a prophylactic dose of tridial or any kind of vasodilation. So I totally agree with this. Yeah, you would do that. Okay. And Professor Bashara. Sorry, I'm, uh, I know it's a last session, but just... Uh, yeah, we, uh, I use those dilators if, uh, you know, if, if there is spasm in the fetal arch, we, we use uh, nitroglycerin intraterior. Excellent. So, so thank you. So let me move to... Yeah, but, uh, I, but I have a comment about the, sure. the spasm. You will have a spasm if you have a part of the arch or patent and the part is not patent. Uh, but if you have a complete occlusion, it's very rare to have a spasm. It's very rare to mm -hmm. do this. So when you are dealing with a complete occlusion of the arch, there is you have an uh, a plug burden and calcification is much more resistant that will relieved by a drug. It needs only a ballooning, and the ballooning only will do this. Excellent, thank you. Um, so let me move to uh, uh, Dr. Khalichawi, Professor Khalichawi. If I, if I mind. Uh, yeah, please. Yeah. I have a question for Dr. Khalichawi. Yes, of course. Yes. Yeah. Uh, it, it, this technique, it, it's a unique technique. I know it's very good. But I have one question going in my mind. You will always go to the dorsal speedus mostly and sometimes to the perineal arch. You will never go to the uh, plantar arch through these techniques. How you can deal if you have an extensive food this, the, uh, infection uh, extending to the salt? This technique on, is only for dealing with the dorsal speedus and sometimes the perineal, or you can have a different modulation to go to the plantar. Well, actually, when you uh, uh, remove the gangrenous uh, uh, tissue and you start to have a bleeding point, all what you care is that this bleeding point, you bring a good flow. You don't care if it's coming from the peroneal, if it's coming from the anterior tibial or whatever. Just, and even uh, when you put your wire, you don't know where this wire is going. You can find this wire going to the peroneal or to the anterior tibial. But whatever you do, just ballooning, this will bring good flow to this point. And this is, I think, will be enough. Right, uh, sh shall we move to uh, Professor Shawi? So, so again, from my uh, very active co-moderator, Professor Dafir Kamal, um, the question is, how reliable is the CO2 angioplasty? Is that correct for TBL, TBL CO2 angioplasty? And, and do you use it routinely? We use uh, it routinely if the patient is uh, a renal impairment. We, we yeah. can't do... Uh, uh, the contrast, angio contrast uh, uh, angioplasty with impaired function of the uh, kidney function. Yeah. And do you have any tricks? Because usually it's a very painful procedure and those yes. patients have CS, critical ischemia, so you can't really lie flat for a long time. Do you have any tricks, sort of like, what did you do them all under general anesthetic? Do you give them any 
strong sedatives or uh, shout uh, at them? I, I think sedation is a good option yeah. and we uh, elevate uh, the leg of the patient from the uh, ankle to decrease the uh, pain. Uh, and uh, I think this is the only we can do that. Right. Okay. Uh, fair enough. So, shall we move next to uh, Professor uh, Mahmoud Nasser, if I may? Um, so, from Dr. Amr al uh, lots of questions. Uh, so, the first thing is, did you cross the SFA sub-intimally or not? And if you did, uh, would you have used DCB? No, I crossed the, the SFA from blue, uh, transluminal, but I found the difficulty only on the proximal cap. So the, I looped the wire and I did sure. uh, only so, the, for the proximal yeah. cap only. So if you take me through it, so you went retrograde from the common femoral, sheathless. Yes. Um, why sheathless? Why didn't you use like a small full French sheath? Because I don't have room for, for any uh, sheath. Right, okay. So because there was no space for a sheath. Yes. So if, if you managed to do that retrogradely and then you had a through and through wire and then you stented from the top, I assume, from yeah. the apical axis, when you tried to access the SFA, why didn't you go integrate if your common femoral artery was because still... It, uh, it was flush occlusion of uh, the SFA. Yeah. So, so you don't, for, for the flush occlusion, occlusion, you just go retrograde yeah, just, from, just from the from start. You don't try start. integrate. Yes. Okay. Um, fair enough. Um, Dr. Welsh Allen? So I have a long list of questions for you. As soon as you finish, I, had, I was just bombarded of, 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 of questions. Right, uh, so this is something for me. So for popliteal arteries, or if you're trying to avoid stenting, how long do you normally inflate your balloon? Do you have any sort of rough idea? From three to five minutes. Right, okay. And if you still have any flow limiting dissection, do you go back and inflate it, or you think yeah, that we, this is not we working? we repeat it two or three times, and then we resort to the stenting. Right. Uh, and, and I had to, two or three people asking the same question, two questions actually. So uh, Dr. Amr Behay and Professor Ahmed Gamal, they, they were asking, how did you prepare the TP trunk before the supera, knowing that you should oversize your balloon uh, to, before you implant the supera? Uh, in the presentation, we showed that we did uh, balloon angioplasty of the segment of the TP perineal trunk as well as the posterior tibial before uh, putting the supera stent. And this uh, was what size balloon? Uh, three millimeter. And you put what size supera? 4.5. Because usually you should uh, sort of oversize the balloon if you, if yeah, you want. Yeah, and I think supera stent has this beauty of conformability. It uh, conforms with the size of the artery. And it elongates uh, if the size of the artery is yeah. uh, less. So to some extent you, ha you were limited to smaller size uh, yeah. sort of, uh, or smaller yeah. diameter balloon. Um, and again, they asked the same question, which crossed my mind as well. Why did you stent proximal to distal, knowing that your proximal stent started in the middle of the lesion? If this is the question that you guys wanted to ask. Why because we... norm normally you start from healthy and you, you go to a healthy segment. Um, if I remember correctly, you started from the middle the of the popliteal. The proximal stent first? Yes, and then the distal stent. You started the proximal stent within the middle of the occlusion, right? Yeah. Yeah. Because uh, we have discrepancy of, this, of the size of the uh, standard segment, we started with the popliteal segment and we went to the smaller diameter. The, right. I mean telescoping the smaller one through the larger one. Yeah. But we couldn't do the reverse. Yeah. So, so what happens if you put the larger stent in, uh, inside the smaller stent, knowing that this opera, you just told us, has the conformability to, to the size? I thought that, that will, there will be an overlap and this might lead to yeah. uh, more uh, problems like stenosis or fracture. Right, but, but normally, if you don't have that size mismatch, you would start from yes. distal, distal sure. to proximally. Yes. Right. Um, and from Professor uh, Hisham Sharaf, uh, for these lesions, obviously we all try to avoid stenting. Do you, you think of using atherectomy devices? We don't have experience in atherectomy devices. It's not available uh, in uh, handy, but uh, I think we might use atherectomy devices to uh, remove this uh, bulky uh, atherosomatic plaque. Right, okay. Um, great. So, um, Dr. Ahmed Naga, <laughs> sorry. Um, so it's, it's very fascinating, the retrograde access, and I can see you have a very low threshold to try to, ret to use retrograde access. Do you think if you have access to re-entry devices, would that reduce the number of cases that you need to uh, access retrogradely? Or do you have experience with the re-entry devices? Going from above, you mean? Yes. I personally do not have any experience using re-entry devices from above. And uh, I don't know, they're not available in my unit uh, anyways. I don't know what's the cost for that. 
um, uh, I think if I had one uh, uh, in service, uh, because we go traditionally from above, so why not to try it? And if failed, I would go retro. retro uh, yeah. That's, that, I think it, it, it is logic. Yeah. Because I, I think there was this study which showed that with the res with the re-entry devices, uh, your re uh, uh, retrograde access sort of need is massively reduced. Uh, because the success rate for re-entry devices, and I think Dr. Cassanos has, has well published one paper on that, is something like 96% uh, uh, for femoral popliteal lesions. Sure. Yeah. Um, and then sort of uh, a question as well from uh, Professor Ahmed Gamal and, and someone else and, and myself, is that if you, uh, in one of your cases, you had the cut down, popliteal cut down, um, and I think they were asking if you wanted to go retrograde from the popliteal. First of all, why not ultrasound guided? The second thing, if you decided to do a cut down anyway, why didn't you do a cut down on the proximal SFA and do end our track to make it a good proximal landing zone? And this will allow you to get anti grade access and maybe anti grade recanalization as well. So you, you asked two questions actually, right? Second. Is that two questions? What, so the two the questions, yes. Yeah. So the, the first question is why uh, not ultrasound guided? Uh, why did I open over the... Uh, Popliteal, not, yeah. Um, to, to be honest, I cannot remember exactly what happened in this case. Why didn't I use ultrasound or, or just go blindly? Uh, yeah. for, uh, under, Was under it like a scope? big leg maybe? Or? Um, uh, I think I had... Uh, he, because he, he needed a femur for play bypass. And uh, uh, and he had a good P1 segment that could be uh, cannulated, and I I don't remember what happened in this case, but I didn't uh, try before cannulating the popliteal the same way I cannulated the anterior tibia. I mean, just a patient being supine and going blindly without ultrasound guided. Uh, this is uh, one case. Second case, I'm not sure whether the popliteal vein would be kind of overlapping over the. Uh, popliteal artery in this place because usually when you dissect P1 segment, usually push yeah. the vein downwards. Yeah. So I will not be very uh, comfortable cannulating it from the medial aspect just using the ultrasound. Right. Okay. The so if, part, if you have another case similar like tomorrow, would you still do a cut down or maybe try ultrasound guided? Uh, or, ultrasound, or maybe leave it till tomorrow until it comes tomorrow. <laughs> I, I, I think I'll try to go from from above as much as I can. If failed, I will go through the uh, anterior tibial or posterior tibial. Okay, right. Because the compression, uh, again, the compression over the, the the P1 segment is not very easy. If you if, if you yes. went percutaneously, sure. uh, how, how would you uh, yeah. compress over yeah. the, the artery? It's it's not easy, certainly. Um, and you guys don't have any questions to each other. You're all satisfied with each, with each other. Uh, may I go back again to Professor Salah because you gave two talks. <laughs> I'll just hand over the questions. So for the second case, um, so, so normally for stenting the popliteal artery, whether this is supera or a covered stent, this is also obviously a flexion area. Do you do any sort of uh, quality control uh, sort of at the end of the case, uh, something like x-ray in the knee bend? Do you do IVUS, for example? No, actually we don't use IVUS, but we use uh, uh, flexion uh, position and we take an angio when the knee is 90 degree yeah. yeah yeah and we see uh, right. the results you know okay. but usually uh, in the aneurysm we use covered stent with the uh, superior the superior gives uh, sure. more uh, yeah so, so so someone was asking as well about the sizing i don't think the the remember to put the names so the sizing of the superior inside a covered stent so so what sizes do you use what diameter stents for the covered stent and the superior because the biggest superior is seven and a half isn't it yeah yeah, yeah. So, so for popliteal aneurysm we probably need something bigger no, actually, yeah, it so was. This one was. No, it was yeah. not uh, okay. bigger yeah, than yeah, so you see, that. Yes, the, the landing zone within was within yes, the range. Yes, I think 5.5 was there. Right, and I had a question from uh, Dr. Ahmed Gamal and separate one from Dr. Ahmed Gamil, um, and the question was, why not open repair for the popliteal artery aneurysm? Uh, this is a, a, a very uh, a good question, very tricky question yeah. also, yeah. because uh, the first case, there was a, a trauma. This was a gunshot, and uh, there was two lesions, the aneurysm and the uh, occlusion. We managed to do it endovascular. Uh, the, the surgery 
was going to be a hell in this because there was hematoma and the right. situation was not very nice and the yeah. possibility of nerve injuries and the yes. vein injury was high. Right. That's why we uh, shifted yeah. to the uh, endovascular. Endo 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 but if you are talking about pure uh, popliteal artery and risk, Yes, uh, surgery yeah, okay. could be a very good option. Also. So, so what is your first, so to, to the panel, so what is your first option if you have a perfectly suitable anatomical popliteal aneurysm with an excellent proximal landing zone, excellent distal landing zone in someone who's fit, fit and, 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 and healthy? Um, I... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, knee replacement. <laughs> <Yes>. uh, <laughs> knee replacement. Yes. So I just want to know, so, so who, who would have an end to first approach? For popliteal. For, for the popliteal aneurysm with an excellent anatomy, like a model anatomy. Right, okay. Sure. Audience? Say again? Surgery. Right, okay. Yeah, sure. So, uh, okay. So for endo, who would, go, would have endo as a first option? Right. And surgery? I think we're, over, we're outnumbered here. <laughs> right. um, okay. So um, then another question from Professor uh, Hisham Sharaf. For popliteal stenting, for like, uh, I, I assume this is uh, for occlusive disease. Do you... Um, use it at the stenting do you use it as your first choice or as a bailout no it's a it's a first uh, choice you know for, for occlusive disease for occlusive disease right. yes okay. you can uh, i think uh, stenting is uh, it, it, usually a must yes. right okay and you never had any problems with sort of stent fractures uh, or, or use just supera for these areas just, just supera just supera, just supera for uh, and may i know what's the, the views of the rest for, for popliteal occlusive disease, is stenting your first option or you try to use it as a bill out? So who goes for first option stenting, apart from Professor Salah? Okay, who goes for it as a bill out? Audience, anyone will go for it as a first option for popliteal uh, uh, stenting for occlusive disease? No? as a bailout. Mm. Right, outnumbered again. Right, okay, so um, this was a very fruitful uh, session, I have to say. It's very exciting, very interesting. I think I've, I've, I have still some questions, but I think I've exhausted all of you. So thank you very much for the excellent talks. These are really nice cases. Thank you for the effort. Thank you very much. And I think this brings us to the end of the, of the day, so I would like to pass on the mic to the chairman of the conference, Professor Taha. Uh, so, um, dear colleague, thank you very much for being so patient uh, till the end uh, of the last minute of this meeting uh, for today. And uh, uh, I have just a little announcement. Uh, you will uh, will serve the, the lunch or late lunch, early dinner uh, at the garden, just at the back of this uh, uh, meeting floor. And uh, tomorrow morning, we will start exactly at 9 o'clock. As I said in the announcement, uh, on the uh, what I uh, wrote before, that uh, tomorrow had a separate registration, and if someone is uh, wishing to have uh, the full registration of this meeting with the certificate of registration he has or she has to register exactly between eight and nine, uh, eight a.m. to nine a.m. early in the morning, we have a very uh, uh, busy schedule for tomorrow. The scientific program is very rich, so I wish to see you tomorrow, all of you, uh, and we'll come again. Thank you. Enjoy your lunch.